Can we start? Yeah. Okay. So welcome to all of you to this uh, panel discussion on the second session of the 13th National People's Congress of China. You know, as you know, the second meeting of 13th NPC and uh, 13th CPPCC, Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, concluded on 15th March. So today, we'll be discussing the context uh, and outcomes of these meetings, uh, which are uh, popularly known as two sessions or Yanghui, and also examine the various issues linked to the meetings. Uh, we have with us you know, a very formidable star studded uh, panel, uh, including uh, Professor Vishwajit Thal, uh, Professor at the Center of Economic Studies and Planning, JNU, Professor Ayman Tadlaka, Professor at the Center for Chinese Initiation Studies, JNU, and already fellow of ICS, Dr. P.K. Anand, Research Associate at the ICS, and we have two discussants. Uh, Professor Ranjit Mohanty, honorary fellow with ICS and distinguished professor at the Council of Social Development, among many other things. And the Professor Alka Acharya, professor at the Center for East Asian Studies, JNU, and honorary fellow with ICS. But as you are aware, you know, these uh, two annual meetings uh, uh, are a key event in China's political calendar. This year, these meetings were held at a particularly difficult and challenging moment, as can be seen very clearly from the various reports uh, which were presented at the NPC and CPPCC. Premier Li Keqiang himself you know, acknowledged as much uh, in his uh, government work report uh, he remarked, and I quote here, China faced a complicated and challenging domestic and international environment of a kind rarely seen in many years. Its economy came under new downward pressure last year. And he went on to state that China will face an even greater and more complicated environment this year. He also acknowledged that uh, the uncertainties of China-US trade friction was impacting growth and contributing to adverse international environment in which China had to pursue its developmental agenda. Indeed, you know, the intensifying uh, Sino-US uh, rivalry constituted the backdrop to the two sessions. 2019 is a sensitive year also because of several big adversaries uh, which are coming up. We have the 70th anniversary of the founding of the PRC, 100th of the May 4th movement, which we have already, you know, commemorated here in this hall, in fact, and the 30th of the Tiananmen Square incident. You know, you would recall that uh, this year commenced with uh, Xi Jinping chairing an important four-day meeting of party leaders uh, which had a stark focus on risks to the party rule and the imperative of maintaining stability across the board. In acknowledgement of this difficult situation, Premier Li has uh, set a relatively modest and flexible GDP growth target of 6 to 6.5 percent for the year, which will be the slowest pace of official reckoning in nearly three decades. Lee acknowledged that even this target will be problematic, but he resisted a large and indiscriminate monetary stimulus to counter deepening slowdown of economy. Instead, he pushed for tax cuts and fee reductions of fairly large magnitude, job creation, administrative streamlining, and what he described as effective support to the real economy. Once again, you know, greater role for the private sector is back in the lexicon of the leadership of China. The Chinese economy will continue to receive booster doses, no doubt, 
there has already been a huge credit expansion the first two months of the year. Obviously, Chinese leadership under Xi Jinping cannot afford to miss the centenary targets of doubling of the 2010 GDP by 2020, which requires you no know, GDP growing at the rate of 6% plus over the next two years, as also the target of eradication of extreme poverty by 2020, which is a key indicator of Xiao Khan society that uh, China is seeking to usher in. But the most prominent outcome of the NPC session, which we'll be discussing today, is the adoption by the NPC of the new foreign investment law, which will come into effect on 1st January 2020. This law was pushed through the legislative process at super speed, really fast speed. In fact, uh, something which has been compared to how some of the foundational you know, legislation were put in place very quickly in 1979. In fact, some comparisons were made to that. Uh, clearly, this was in response to growing negative sentiments being articulated by foreign investors from the USA and the West in particular. Uh, another important consideration has been to do this paid work or set the stage for uh, the trade deal China and the USA have been negotiating for quite some time now. This legislation claims to level the playing field between the foreign domestic investors according to the system of pre-establishment national treatment. No, the distinction between pre-establishment national treatment and post-establishment national treatment. So now they are going for pre-establishment national treatment plus a negative list. But the initial reaction of the investor community is mixed at best. This law is still being seen as work in progress, where some initial steps have been taken, a broad framework has put in place, but a lot of filling up of details needs to be done. And this was acknowledged as much by Li Chang in his press conference on the last day of the NPC when he assured you know, the investor community that uh, the legislative framework will fleshed out in the months to come with new rules being framed under it. Now in foreign policy domain, again China is under considerable pressure as there is growing pushback from the USA and the West in particular to its regional and global ambitions and assertive behavior. In fact, one can see a sort of uh, pulling back by China trying to you know, address these concerns by downplaying some of its ambitions. You know, like many in China, 2025 has virtually disappeared from official media. Uh, references to PRI also, in fact, are no longer as prominent as what used to be the case earlier in uh, Li Chang's government work report, in fact, reference is relatively modest. <coughs> now, changing the global narrative about China was clearly a priority of the NPC session. Uh, to what extent they are able to achieve that is something worth debating. Now, in today's panel discussion, I just highlighted some of the issues that we will be discussing. There are many more issues like, you know, and we will talk about social security, you know, concerns that are being addressed, uh, the other issues which uh, other colleagues will discuss. Uh, I'll begin the panel discussion by inviting, you know, Professor Vishwajithar to make his presentation. Then uh, we'll have presentations by Hemant and Anand and uh, remarks by Professor Manti and uh, Professor Alkacharya at uh, discussions. Vishwajit, over to you. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Walfi. And at the outset, I'd like to thank um, Ambassador uh, Khan and. Uh, I could just. No, uh, I, I haven't asked how much time. So, how much time do you think for? 10 to 12 minutes each? Yeah. yeah. I, I just rushed by. Uh, you can share this presentation and. Uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. So, um, so, I'd like to thank uh, Ambassador Khan and Professor Mohanty for giving me this opportunity to. Uh, speak on this uh, uh, very important development and uh, you know and uh, I've been actually looking at the foreign investment uh, policies of <coughs> countries for a long time 
and and I think that you know what has been done, uh, and uh, Professor Kant, uh, Mr. Kant is absolutely correct that this is really work in progress. But uh, you know what one can see in this investment law is a fine sort of balancing between the interests of the foreign of the foreign investors and the domestic investors, because I mean, after all, you know there is uh, uh, China is going through this process of rebalancing, and. Uh, it is now uh, sort of indicating that uh, this future growth strategies would be dependent on you know creating domestic demand, and I think uh, a lot would have to be of this would have to be taken up by you know the the, the domestic investors. So I you know there's a um, um, I would say that uh, this law is also um, is quite different from whatever we have seen um, uh, you know in in terms of investment laws uh, developing generally globally. And there are push towards uh, you know, global multilateral investment regimes, and uh, so as, as, as a student of these investment laws, I was finding this as a, as a very, a very different and uh, you know, full of nuances in terms of how China looks at uh, foreign risk in investors. So, if it does it go? Ambassador Kant mentioned that this is a, a, a very important development in the, uh, the plenary session of the NPC. And uh, this was, in fact, uh, a long awaited legislative change. And uh, uh, in fact, the first uh, uh, signals that China is going to amend its foreign investment law came as early as in January 2015. And uh, the first draft was unveiled at that time. And this was really a very bulky document with 11 chapters and 170 articles, and it had, uh, uh, you know, uh, quite a lot of, you know, it was not really well focused. But after, uh, in the in the interregnum, and especially after the trade war began with the United States last year, uh, a revised draft was put in place in December. Uh, and as uh, uh, you know, Ambassador Khan mentioned, it was really put together in quick time, and it uh, came into. Uh, you know, it was unveiled very, very quickly uh, within within three months, uh, and uh, this law. Uh, so this law is going to be the comprehensive legal basis governing future investment and business activities of uh, foreign firms in China. Now, um, interestingly, uh, you know, this the, this law replaces the set of laws which were called the Three Enterprise Law, and uh, this was the basis of our investment policies of. of China, right from the 80s. In fact, the first of these laws, uh, the law on Chinese foreign equity joint venture, was adapted in 1979, and then the two other laws came in 86 because they were revised later. So now, instead of these three laws, now we're going to have a comprehensive, uh, you know, foreign investment law. And uh, and importantly, these three laws, the the three enterprise laws, saw China catapult uh, to one of the largest recipients of foreign investment. So you can see the way things have changed in terms of China's as a destination for foreign, foreign investment. It was, uh, you know, in, in, in 1980 it was 57 million uh, dollars, and that went up to 136 billion dollars in, in in 2017. And if you see uh, this number as a share of the developing country inflows, it actually has kept growing. You know, so despite the you know sort of the the negative press and the sort of uh, uh, you know the sentiments that China is no longer a very attractive destination. In terms of the numbers, you know you don't see the kind of slowdown that uh, you know at least in relative terms uh, in, the, in terms of FDI, FDI inflows. Um, uh, uh, so um, now, what are the triggers? And I I, I think that there are uh, uh, three triggers uh, for the enactment of the foreign investment law. 
The first is, uh, you know, the positioning of China as a leader of trade investment liberalization by Xi Jinping. You know, this is uh, something that he said very early on once he uh, assumed uh, office. Uh, the second was that, you know, in the WTO, in the World Trade Organization, China has become a very strong proponent of an investment agreement. Investment agreement has, uh, has been something that the, the developed world has been pushing for, but uh, lately China has become one of the big, biggest votaries. And uh, you know, towards that end, uh, an investment facilitation agreement is now being discussed. Again, China is leading that discussion. And third is, of course, the trade war with the United States and the accusations uh, that, uh, again, Ambassador Khan referred to of the way the, China, or the Chinese have treated the foreign firms. And, and particularly, what made headlines was the, the forced technology transfer issue that they forced uh, the foreign firms to part with uh, the, the technology and. And, and therefore violating intellectual property rights. So for, for the United States, this was a, a major um, uh, issue that uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, was uh, affecting their relations with China. Uh, I'm, uh, you know, I just briefly uh, look at these uh, elements of foreign investment clause, and in my, in my view, it can be you know sort of divided into these uh, you know um, sections. The first is the definition of foreign investment, and this is a very important issue. Because uh, the way foreign investment is defined, and uh, we ourselves have gone through this process here in India, um, uh, you know, we have redefined the way foreign investment will be treated in our bilateral investment treaties. The whole issue of national treatment, how you know foreign investors and domestic investors are treated, uh, and and most favored nation clause, where uh, you know China uh, gives would give equal treatment to investors coming from all all the different countries. And also the pre-establishment phase, uh, including the pre-establishment phase, the investment facilitation issue, which is uh, uh, again, as I said, in the WTO has become uh, headlines. The terms of invest investment protection, and there are issues of expropriation of investment, which is uh, really uh, a very important issue. Guarantees allowing repatriation in foreign currency, foreign investors, and protection of intellectual property rights. And then, then there are a, a few, uh, you know, um, issues which we don't see usually in the investment clause these days, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, this, the host country uh, government uh, directing the foreign investment. Uh, of course, there is a talk of a negative list, but I was looking at uh, uh, some of the other documents, recent documents. They also delineate the areas in which foreign investors would be allowed to invest. Uh, that's I'll, I'll just come to that in a moment. Then there are obligations of invest investors. These the, the the obligations of in on investors is something that we haven't really discussed since the good old days of the Antar. You know, Antar had this uh, um, had a had this, uh, um, negotiations on a, a code of conduct on uh, on multinationals, and it was talking about uh, obligations of investors at that time. And uh, then there are resolution of disputes is, is again again a major issue because uh, most of the investment agreements have a dispute resolution mechanism that involves uh, uh, you know uh, an international tribunal um, looking at disputes between the, uh, the, the, the the foreign investors and the, and the host uh, governments. So um, uh, you know this is one issue which I was uh, very important because the investor state dispute settlement mechanism is uh, something that. Uh, it's, it's really a, 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 you know, a very contentious issue. And uh, foreign investors have the powers to initiate disputes against most countries or governments in a private international tribunal. Um, we in India have, 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 have discussed this issue. And, uh, and then um, we have taken uh, our, you know, uh, a position uh, that uh, this, this particular powers need to be truncated and in a, in a, in a new model uh, bilateral investment uh, treaty we have uh, uh, done the necessary things. Now definition of investment, you know, there are two broad definitions. One is the enterprise based definition which is similar to the concept of foreign direct investment that we all have, uh, have, have, have studied at one point or the other. And the other is the asset based definition which is significantly large, uh, broad where, um, you know, it includes portfolio investments, intangible assets uh, such as intellectual property. So all forms of assets, whatever can be designed, defined as assets uh, by foreign investors, those are uh, brought under protection. 
Um, usually, an asset-based definition is taken because you know the investors demand that every aspect of their operation should be protected. But uh, the, the foreign investment law uh, actually produces uh, proposes a more limited enterprise-based definition where uh, what is uh, what is said is the foreign investors obtain stocks, shares, property, uh, property shares, and other forms of equity and other similar rights and interests of enterprise in the territory of China. So the, the next issue is uh, of national treatment, where uh, there is a commitment made that foreign investors will be treated at par with domestic investors. And um, all, the, all the policies of the state, whatever promotional policies that the state takes, uh, uh, would also be equally applicable to the foreign investors. Now the pre-establishment national treatment is a, is a very significant uh, issue that you just heard. And, um, and this is the, the, the treatment uh, given to foreign investors at the stage, state of en entry uh, should not be lower than that of domestic investors and the investments. And, and this basically means in, in, uh, in brief that there be no screening of foreign investors on, a, an, on any ground uh, you know, before they enter. Because uh, most countries like India uh, too has, uh, does not give a pre-establishment national treatment. We, uh, give a national treatment only after the foreign investors have established their uh, shop here. Uh, the uh, most favored nation clause is again interesting from the way China is negotiating in different forms, international uh, you know, investment agreements. And this says that you know if China uh, negotiates uh, an investment uh, agreement which is uh, better than that they already have, then the new agreement will be applicable to the foreign investors. And here this is significant because uh, uh, China is uh, negotiating a, uh, a mega regional trade agreement in the East Asian region. It's called the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which also includes investment. Uh, and there is a push towards uh, uh, a very high quality investment agreement there. And and I think that this most favored nation clause is uh, is been put there uh, with that uh, uh, objective in mind. Investment facilitation is is really the buzzword today. And as I mentioned that. Uh, this is really becoming uh, 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 one of the two very important issues in the WTO discussions today, and and there are um, uh, a range of uh, uh, you know measures that uh, the the law uh, proposes, which uh, says that uh, the foreign investors uh, would, would actually their operations would be facilitated in in in, in very different ways by the by the, uh, the central government by the state governments, and. Um, and also provide uh, foreign investment, uh, you know, the improve of foreign investment service system, provide consultation other services. So, so really, you know, sort of this is reaching out to the foreign investors, saying that you know we'll do everything that is required to uh, improve your, uh, uh, you know, uh, your operations here in this country. The investor protection um, is, uh, uh, you know, there are uh, uh, there are uh, again uh, certain. Uh, uh, certain, um, uh, you know, the statements about protection of investment income, other legitimate rights and interests of foreign investors. Uh, 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 there is, uh, uh, you know, a sort of a, you know, yes or no in terms of commitment to, uh, not to expropriate investment. Because, um, uh, you know, uh, um, the state uh, says that it would uh, expropriate investment of foreign investors in accordance with the law as deemed necessary for public, invest in, uh, public investment. Now this leaves the door a little open because uh, you know there is a lot of discretionary powers that the state has uh, in order to uh, uh, you know sort of uh, 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 to act against any foreign investors uh, should the situation arise. And um, and uh, all the, uh, the profits made by the uh, foreign investors or if they want to repatriate capital, that can be done in either the RMB or foreign currency. So, in terms of taking money out to funds away, away, uh, out of China, they have been given complete freedom. <coughs> Protection of intellectual property is really the key, and I think the foreign investors were looking at this issue, and the American government too, as administration was uh, banking a lot on what uh, China would do, and there is a pretty unequivocal uh, you know, commitment to protect intellectual property. And, um, and, and uh, you know, at the last point that you can see here, that administrative agencies and the staff shall not use administrative means to force transfer of technology. So uh, this, is, this is something that the Americans and other uh, you know, Western countries have been complaining. 
and I mean this has uh, come uh, very uh, uh, clearly in in the in, in the statement that is there. Now um, you know the uh, there is a, a substantial uh, uh, element in the in the law which is uh, uh, which talks about directing foreign investors to to invest in in specific areas. Now the, the the language is very interesting. It says that the state encourages and guides foreign investors to invest in specific uh, uh, industries, fields, and regions in accordance with the needs of national economic and social development. So again, in terms of the control over uh, you know the investment and how uh, China one wants to use foreign investment, th there is uh, I don't see any change as compared to what is that what was happening earlier. And uh, I was uh, looking at the latest catalog of industries for guiding foreign investment, and this came out in November 2018. And this has three categories of uh, sectors. Uh, there is a positive list. It says, uh, what are the sectors in which the state encourages foreign investors to invest? And these identified sectors are all in high technology areas. And it's, it's absolutely, uh, you know, that, that seems to be the underlying uh, you know sort of uh, uh, reason why it has been included and these are also finely tuned to the current needs of the Chinese economy. It's, it's quite amazing when you go through the entire list and then there is a special management measures and this is what they call the negative list where uh, foreign investors uh, uh, you know will not be allowed to enter automatically uh, you know so those who are uh, familiar with the terms that we use in India there is an automatic route and then there is a government route so this is uh, this is a government kind of regulated group, and then the third is a prohibited uh, industries for foreign investment. Now uh, the the new law says that the negative list would be uh, would be added and would additionally stipulate areas and conditions for restri for uh, restricted uh, conditions of restricted foreign investment, and um, and I you know uh, given that this uh, list from which I have drawn uh, this uh, this slide comes only a few months back. I don't see how China, and, and given the kind of a situation, the state in which the economy is, will move very far away from doing exactly what it is doing now. There are a set of in investor obligations, and of course one is the security, uh, 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 you know, sort of ex exception that the state foreign investors will be pulled up once if, if they do anything to endanger national security or harm public interest. And, and one uh, 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 quite uh, interesting uh, part of this investment, foreign investment law, which has always been there in China, is about workers' rights. You know, this is something of a complete anatomy, you know, anatomy when it comes to any other uh, investment agreement, which is workers' rights. So, workers' rights of foreign investment shall establish trade union organizations. Now, uh, the, the the practice right, uh, all around the world is that the Workers' rights are usually truncated. There's a flexible, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, labor laws which are applied when it comes to foreign investors. But here, this issue has actually been reinforced with the new law. And uh, and and uh, uh, for 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 those of us who actually look at the foreign investment issues and look at, uh, uh, you know, are always looking for data and information, uh, there is a disclosure norm that has been put in there and. Uh, and they're supposed to submit in investment in information to operative commercial authorities through private registration system. So, in terms of you know transparency and accountability, you know there are uh, very uh, I think uh, clear provisions that are put as part of investor obligations. Um, again, usually uh, you know sort of competition law is not uh, attached to the investment uh, uh, laws. Uh, of course, in, in case of any takeovers by foreign uh, foreign companies competition law does come in, but here, you know, the, this bridge has also been, uh, you know, uh, uh, the gap has also been bridged in the, uh, the, the law. Um, in the dispute settlement resolution, the entire process of dispute settlement resolution, uh, the dispute resolution mechanism is administrative. It would have, would have, would be done administratively. Like I mentioned that, you know, in the, in the usual practice today is to have this uh, uh, investor state dispute settlement mechanism where the foreign investors are given the, the complete freedom uh, to take uh, not just the, uh, the you know, if they are in a joint venture, not not the, just the joint venture, venture partner, but also the host con host government to an international, uh, private international tribunal. Uh, and um, and uh, the, 
the important aspect of this uh, in, 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 uh, the investor state is to settlement mechanism is that the ruling of the the, the uh, you know the tribunal is final and binding on all countries on all parties and in fact recently india has lost a few disputes and has to pay huge uh, payouts to the foreign investors so again you know uh, in terms of the uh, the dispute settlement i don't think this is going to please any of the foreign countries and their investors the way this is this, this has been uh, this has been uh, put together so in conclusion um, uh, you know my reading is that it's a familiar ironclad regime uh, uh, ironclad regime for dealing with foreign <coughs> investors investors rights have been defined to some extent i would say but clearly foreign investors would not enjoy the freedom that they are currently enjoying enjoying many other jurisdictions so there are boundaries set and and most significant are investor investor obligations which have been completely almost gone, gone out of currency in the present global order and the, uh, finally as i mentioned foreign investors can re resolve their issues only through administrative mechanisms china does not give them access to the preferred investment status will serve my mechanism so uh, you know ambassador kan was absolutely correct when you know uh, the, the the foreign investors would have would be two binds you know there are there are some some steps which have been taken forward but i do not think it goes far enough to assert them thank you thank you no professor for that uh, very you know uh, uh, comprehensive uh, yet concise uh, introduction to foreign investment law a very important initiative taken by chinese government something which was uh, in the pipeline for quite some time but has been pushed through um, in recent months so uh, i'm sure we'll have a lot of questions during q and a session uh, now we'll move on to anand we'll talk about uh, some social security related issues coming out of npc session and then we'll come to hemant who will talk about political issues anand uh good afternoon uh, thank you uh so uh thank you uh when uh, we were uh, putting up this uh, panel for uh, the npc uh the discussion which i had with uh, the professor acharya and professor uh, mohanty was and the brief which was given to me was on to discuss on uh, welfare and labor so i will stick to that and uh, go through the set of documents uh, of both uh, the work report by mika chiang and the other sets of documents which includes uh, the ndrcs the national development and reform commission's uh, reports on both the plan for 2018 and the targets for 2019 so those are the two essential documents which i have looked at uh and from these two documents i will like to flag certain issues uh, not a lot of them because a lot of the other issues are generally what you generally find in uh, narratives or documents which are issued by the party and the state both in terms of the npc and the different forums so there are certain ambitions there are uh, tasks which the party uh, or the state has set forward uh, but apart from that what do you find certain interesting things uh, that i would like to generally uh, flag uh to begin with if you want to look at the npc i think the context needs to be provided and the context i would like to go back to is the 19th uh, party congress and the political report of xi jinping uh so the party uh, congress the, the report was primarily it started with the fact of the principal contradiction and the principal contradiction was between unbalanced and inadequate development and people's ever growing needs for a better life so things begin from there and that provides the context uh, on for the uh, second uh, session as well so how do you look at that uh, principal contradiction and how do you situate it vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this particular session and i one can call that as still a work in progress uh one of the fundamental issues which i could find in terms of uh, which runs through both the work report and the uh, plan document is a significant emphasis on employment i mean there are repeated em uh, emphasis on employment by uh, by both lika chair and the ndrc document in fact there are mu uh, my multiple uh, times when employment comes into the picture in fact uh, to quote uh, 
in, in the work report it appears that employment first policy will be pursued in full force and the cornerstone employment is actually the cornerstone of well-being and wellspring of wealth. So there is an elevation and a recognition of employment as a primus, primary thing uh, in the country. And in fact, uh, then the report goes into details on how uh, employment targets will be achieved. Uh, there is talk of uh, urban job creation. There is talk of uh, creating employment opportunities for non-agricultural surplus workforce, uh, using multiple channels to uh, employ different sets of people from college graduates, uh, to demobilize military personnel, rural migrant workers, graduates returning from foreign universities, and how they would be placed in the uh, in the employment uh, or under various uh, senses that uh, definitely comes through. Uh, there is also mention of the role of the private sector and how uh, there is also need for flexible employment, uh, new forms of employment. This includes even providing internships uh, to uh, students and of course also which uh, comes along with the fact is how a vocational education needs to be more integrated and uh, into in, in the country. So if you look at the, all the report there is a long running thread about employment and I see this as some kind of a tension and apprehension within uh, as a sensitive issue for the party state in terms of going by the discourse of uh, stability and as well as uh, of, of a harmonious uh, system. Uh, of course, there is being a report or the work report, there are not clear indications of the sector wise classification of em employment and how, uh, where employment is more required. Uh, but there are certain things which one could also take away. So, for example, uh, in the report, there is a sense of uh, how the overcapacities have been brought down, especially in the steel and coal sector. In fact, both these sectors were one of the biggest uh, public sectors for uh, in China. So there has been a long-standing conflict in terms of cutting down and uh, or the overcapacities in both these industries, both from an ecological point of view and from an economic point of view. But uh, that also necessitates uh, retrenchments, and that had raised a lot of human cry in 2016 when this was first proposed. So, but now that overcapacities have been cut down, there have been retrenchments of workers and employees from both these sectors. But how exactly these workers have been rehabilitated? That is not detailed in the report, but there is a tension which emerges on how these workers who have lost their jobs or are out of work, how their rehabilitation is going to take place. And also, uh, when you also read employment, that also needs to be lined up or seen as an alignment with a sense that which the report constantly talks about is the need to ease business. So there is talk of how startups need to be promoted, how, how uh, incubators and entrepreneurial spirit needs to be uh, charged up. So it, it looks as if the jobs are also going to be seen in terms of entrepreneurs uh, emerging. I mean, so it is coming completely out of the state into the non-state sector. Uh, Another key thing which needs to be also be seen along with uh, the uh, employment situation is one which Amalika Kanta mentioned in his opening note is that there is no visible mention of Made in China 2025 which is actually a program also in terms of if you look at it from an employment uh, lens so it is an extremely significant point of view but of course there is at least in name wise if, if even if there is some kind of a jettisoning but there is definitely emphasis uh, by the premier in terms of uh, finding em uh, employment and also in terms of uh, developing high-tech manufacturing, uh, biomedicine, automobile industries, those uh, things continue to remain. Uh, one of the things which generally one finds is why, if, if one wants to answer the question of why Made in China 2025 has been dropped as, as a term, I think the US-China trade wars over the last one year has also had uh, an effect and the heavy subsidies which the government gives for promotion of these industries under targets have also had a ripple effect on uh, both in the US and in the European markets. The second issue which I find uh, which is of importance and uh, this also was there in the uh, political report of Xi Jinping uh, in 2017 but also which finds now in uh, the work report is on workplace and industrial safety and there is a repeated cognizance of the need to maintain uh, industrial safety, workplace safety, provide, prevent accidents from happening at workplaces but that doesn't seem to translate onto the ground. Even though that there is definitely a mention in the report that there is 
uh, need for uh, maintaining uh, or preventing workplace accidents. Within the last 10 days, there have been two major workplace accidents in in uh, Chiangsu province, for example. So this earlier, which was prevalent in the coal uh, industry, now you are seeing in even manufacturing. In chemical industries, especially a big issue. And it's not just about loss of life and uh, property. It's all, there's also an ecological and environmental dimension also which comes in in terms of uh, industrial accidents. In fact, uh, if you look more, uh, to go back to again Xi Jinping's political report of the 19th Congress, he had clearly marked that we will build an educated, skilled, and innovative workforce, foster respect for model workers, promote quality workmanship, and see that taking pride in labor becomes a social norm, and seeking excellence is valued as a good work ethic. I believe that even going through this report and also how uh, things have been presented in the last two years in China, I think that is still there is still some distance to go. Be because the context for this is China has also been seeing high number of uh, labor protests um, on issues of unpaid social security, wage areas, shifting of industries from the coast even to interior or even outside the country. And the party state has tried to meet the labor unrest with both the heavy handedness of uh, repression and also in terms of responsiveness in terms of trying to accommodate and provide arbitration mechanisms. So it uses both these heavy right hand and the softer left hand to uh, well in fact in the last one year we have also seen heavy crackdown on uh, student uh, support groups of for the workers uh, in, in different campuses of, of uh, China. So that also presents as an uh, important context when uh, one studies this. One final point on uh, the worker and the labor point of view. There has been interesting studies which have also said that especially in Changchun and Guangdong, which have been the hotspots of uh, labor contention in China over the last many years, there has also been significant rise in allocations on public security. So allocations for the people's armed police, for example, over the last few years has gone significantly higher as how uh, labor unrest have uh, taken place. So. This is something uh, which needs to be taken into consideration. When you come to welfare and the social security as, uh, as as significant points which through the report, one significant standout is, seems to be poverty elevation. And poverty elevation is actually Xi Jinping's uh, one of uh, pet missions. In fact, the idea is to eliminate poverty as a mission, is to eliminate poverty by the year 2020. Uh, in fact, poverty elevation is along with both financial risk and environmental protection form three critical battles which uh, the party state has identified that needs to be fought. So how uh, poverty elevation needs to be uh, tackled, it, there are measures of budgetary inputs, uh, relief capacity and also significantly taking the help of support groups and community uh, uh, community organizations. So that also there is now talk of involving the SOEs but of course that is still open to interpretation on how much the SOEs will be able to uh, pro uh, provide its own help. And throughout, uh, it also seems among the poor provinces with, uh, which uh, China identifies, some of them are really provinces like, or uh, autonomous regions like Tibet, Xinjiang, and even populations uh, in places like uh, Sichuan, Yunnan, Gansu, and Qinghai, which are, which are uh, also some of the uh, sensitive uh, border regions. And, uh, on other aspects of social security, if one looks at there is constant emphasis which which need uh, which uh, is, is also prevalent in previous reports is the fact that insurance based models have to be uh, supported. But one significant difference which I found in this uh, during this uh, session's uh, reporting by Premier Li Kachia, there is a mention that the employer, or because that uh, Chinese insurance models works in for the contribution of both the employer and the employee and some subsidies by the state. There is significant mention that the employer's contributions have been brought down. However, it doesn't seem to know how or how who pockets the bill or whether the state has entered into extra subsidies to some of these enterprises or some of these enterprise managements. That is not uh, clearly mentioned. Uh, another point which uh, which I like to flag as as uh, something to be put out on the table is that Hugo reforms seem to be still uh, growing or it's it's actually limping. In fact, uh, there is still a lot of promise which has been shown that there is significant efforts to ensure that uh, Hugo reforms will be undertaken and that there is considerable progress being done and there is an aim 
to uh, loosen more or bring more people into the cities. But however, uh, on the ground, you see there is still re uh, resistance from some of the main cities. And in fact, uh, over the last few years, there have been eviction drives in even Beijing uh, for some of the blue collar workers, uh, people living in regions where blue collar workers form a significant part. So, to look at it in overall context and overall how you put both these sessions, I mean the second uh, session of the MPC and how you see both in terms of social security issues and uh, work related issues, I think it's still a mixed bag and how however much ever you point out on the forums and in these uh, in the documents it looks good on paper but how much it, it gets implemented on the ground that is something which uh, china has been uh, lagging and, and that is something that needs to be for thank you anand for you know bringing out you know various uh, labor and welfare related issues uh, that have been dealt with uh, the main documents you know, presented at the npc especially you know um, uh, Premier Lika Chang's uh, government work report and the plan document and uh, linking these documents with uh, Xi Jinping's work report at the 19th Party Congress. Uh, uh, you know, Anand has brought up a whole lot of issues relating to industrial safety, la labor unrest, uh, uh, you know, UCO reform, uh, which uh, we'll be discussing further during Q&A session. Now uh, I'll request um, Dr. Anand Laka to make his presentation. Thank you, Ambassador Kantra. I mean, let me first, uh, I think, congratulate ICS for initiating this uh, discussion on, on this theme because we are barely within weeks when it concluded last month. And in fact, the ink hasn't dried up yet, and, and we are discussing the NPC report. Uh, now, having said that, um, my previous two um, co panelists have very comprehensively dealt with the uh, economic aspect and the social aspects of the report. So I'll try not to repeat that and focus instead on the political uh, context in which uh, the NPC or the two sessions were held. Um, to begin with, as Ambassador Kanta in his intro had mentioned that this, I mean, there is a broad, wide acknowledgement that this uh, Liangui two sessions were conducted at a very difficult and challenging moment for China. I mean, agreeing with that, and he'd also mentioned that this uh, 2019 is also going to be a very in important and crucial year because there are many anniversaries which might uh, be celebrated in, into this uh, this year. There's one anniversary which um, I would like to begin with by mentioning, and I think that is that sets the backdrop of the Liangui sessions. And that anniversary was not in this year. That was the 125th birth anniversary of Mao, which was just uh, in December last year. And uh, why I'm saying that, because it, it was a very low profile uh, celebration of Mao's 125th anniversary. And there are reasons, political reasons for that. And that is what I consider as a very important backdrop to the government work report which was presented by Prime Minister Li Keqiang at the second session and also the CPPCC uh, session. Anand also mentioned uh, uh, that he, he, his framework was more in the political report con uh, of the 2017-19 uh, Party Congress uh, context. So, <clears throat> I'd like to begin also from that, but slightly on a different note. And the political uh, backdrop which I mentioned is that if we notice from the last Party Congress onwards, there has been I mean, as it has been highlighted and noted in the media, especially the Western media also, for, of course, specific reasons, that there has, there has been too much of talk of uh, deepening of reforms since the last party congress, but nothing has actually happened on the ground. <coughs> and 
especially Xi Jinping in his political report also uh, he, he had emphasized and uh, focused on initiating the supply side reforms. Uh, that of course hasn't happened and why that hasn't happened there are political reasons for that and as it was mentioned in the intro also the difficult and challenging moment for these NPC sessions when we note we uh, we also tend we, we also must pay attention that the the political reforms which has been talked about a lot in the media is nowhere in sight no discussion either in the uh, official reports like this or the other discourse which is coming up. So why is that so? So I will uh, try to put together, because the time is limited, but I will try to put together a couple of, a series of actually, a series of uh, meetings, uh, high level meetings which have taken place, especially uh, in the previous year in China, which have a very heavy uh, kind of influence on on the limitations of the government report which has been presented at the second session this year and why even the deepening of reforms is failing to take place. So it is in that context uh, that I highlight some of the uh, political reasons in the backdrop of this report. Now to, to begin with, as one knows is the Chinese state media, the state machinery very, very good in uh, propaganda. So there were a lot of commentaries by Xinhua also and by uh, commentators also in trying to highlight the uniqueness of the Chinese political system under as we all know China model but within the China model also highlighting the uh, two sessions as uh, something which is uh, unique to China and a very very important political feature or uh, feature of the Chinese democratic system and they compared that with first highlighting that how outside China the world is in chaos and everywhere there is problem either political problem or economic problem and it is only in China that political stability is there and that political stability is ensuring the economic growth as well. So some of the things like they, they, they highlighted the problems which America is facing then the problems in the United Kingdom and then comes the NPC and <clears throat> I mean it's successful China model and because of the CPC leadership and also because of the Xi Jinping as the core leader all these things put together make NPC as a unique feature of the Chinese democratic model. Now very quickly I, I mean I'll, I, I will not go into the actual uh, nitty gritty of the report presented by Li Keqiang but some things which need to be highlighted here, uh, this of course these facts are known to most of us, GDP growth rate <coughs> is this budget deficit 2.8, defense budget also has been cut and uh, there will be 2 trillion yuan cut in the taxes to shore up the economy. And another interesting thing was the uh, no mention of uh, China 2025 or 2025 plan as Anand also mentioned. This is very interesting because uh, it was missing in the report and of course not highlighted in the media reports also. But there was another thing which was very much mentioned and emphasized in the report but missing in the media reports both western media or outside media and Chinese media and that was that there was a special focus. Uh, in the report and also then that was emphasized further by various uh, provincial representatives to the NPC on uh, uh, strong measures should be adopted to uh, ensure uh, no gender discrimination at workplace and uh, I mean one can go into more details later if one has time but this was a, this is one of the focus which was there in the report but hardly reported elsewhere. Then the background, as already mentioned. <coughs> now, uh, now, what is NPC? All of us uh, have read about NPC and generally the impression is that NPC is a rubber stamp body where hardly there is any discussion of any kind, etc, etc. But if you look deeper into that, it's actually not that rubber stampy as it, as it has been called. 
this this year's uh, government work report in particular uh, if you go by some of the chinese media of hong kong and singapore and <clears throat> other places then literally it is mentioned that literally li ke chang was actually handed out the report before he delivered the report and uh, and it went through a very very meticulous and rigorous process of finalizing the report which uh, had gone through at least by 10000 uh, cadres and uh, officials of different levels and 4000 experts who deal with economic affairs and uh, the process had started at least 6 months in the making before the report was finalized and the i mean why i say that it's not that rubber stamp as it is made out to be because even till the last minute the uh, the uh, changes in the choice of terms and words uh, was happening till it was finally agreed upon that yes now this should go and the prime minister should deliver it that's why in the media in chinese media in particular this time it was mentioned as nan chan that this report was a mammoth and herculean <coughs> task to prepare and just to mention uh, in passing again that was something which is uh, i mean reported very widely in the chinese media but i have hardly seen that in the english media that uh, li ke chang has been reported to be uh, so much under pressure while he was delivering his 100 minute speech that he was full of sweat throughout and he didn't even have time to wipe off his sweat that's that's how it was reported and and the and the reason for that and there are political reasons for that because again as i said that within the party there is a <coughs> debate very intense debate going on on not not on the two issues which have been highlighted in the beginning as the difficult and challenging moment under which this is being conducted i e uh, us trade war trade war with us and uh, the slowing down of chinese economy i mean these are of course uh, <coughs> well known factors but more important than this if you look at the internal debates is the nature and the direction of the reforms uh, where should the reforms go from here that is the issue which is being debated very intensely within the party and of course uh, trade war with us uh, whole of last year and it's still continuing has not made the task easy uh, <clears throat> so in that that is the context in which uh, this report was presented and now just just a, a quick political chronology of the series of meetings i mentioned starting with the 2017 cpc 19 party congress where xi jinping was um, <clears throat> declared as a core leader and xi jinping xi jinping thought find found a place in the party constitution then we come to the two sessions last year where prc constitution was amended and the limitation to the <clears throat> tenure of the president and the vice president was removed Uh, then uh, february 2018 cpc 19 central committee third plenary session adopts a new draft reform to carry out top bottom deeper reforms in party and state institution this was a very important exercise which took more than 6 uh, to 8 months uh, to be completed and it was uh, uh, carried out vertically from top to every provincial level almost all the 31 uh, administrative zones and provinces in china they had uh, implemented this and this was basically to make sure that there is complete uh, loyalty and there is complete integrity with the central leadership at every level top top, top bottom <coughs> then november 2018 uh, <coughs> and by november 2018 this exercise was completed and it was eight such exercise since the reforms had started in 1978 four decades ago then um, and it was carried out at every level as i mentioned from the state council to the party uh, branches and to government and mass organizations and ngos etc etc and and the main plan main political plan on which it was carried out was that strengthen the party and integrate with the leadership 
and this is something and this is very interesting because if you look at uh, 2017 party congress onwards including the second session government work report this year which uh, Professor Dhar uh, has very comprehensively introduced to us the contents of that and <clears throat> even there we still don't know that what are the areas in which this foreign investment law will be implemented and as Anand also had uh, apprehended that sounds very nice in documents but let's see when it gets implemented. If at all it gets implemented also, there are reports indicating that this will be beginning with only limited service sector and begin, it will begin with health and maybe insurance and uh, <coughs> education maybe. So strengthen the party and integrate with the leadership and again in Chinese, if those who can read the Chinese, the first sentence says Tang Chang Pu Fan. Basically means no separation of party and government. This is just opposite to what Tang Xiaoping had said in the beginning of the reforms where he had said that Tang Chang Fan Khai, that separate party from the government. And it is now coming back. And uh, <clears throat> so, so the new gov governance formula is based on Tang Chang Pu Fan. And many uh, commentators and many uh, <clears throat> people have pointed out that this whole thing is basically revival of what Mao Tse Tung had said during his time, how the party should take control and how the party should govern. The party to lead in every sphere. So this, this is what I am saying, this is very interesting that on the one hand, uh, if you look at the uh, reports in the media about the uh, either uh, no signs of deepening of reforms taking place or whatever uh, new deepening reform measures are being introduced. They are very limited and cosmetic type, not very substantive. And the reasons for that is basically somewhere the party is becoming very, very sensitive about uh, the challenges from within and challenges from outside which the party is facing politically. And interesting thing is that the Western media has been accusing rather to the top CPC leadership, especially Xi Jinping, that even in his, uh, even in this report, NPC second session report also was commented upon by some media quarters as being defined. Defined means still not openly saying what kind of uh, substantive reform measures are going to be implemented. But within China, if you look at the Chinese debates and all that, the, the opinion is completely opposite to this defined uh, image. Uh, everybody is saying outside China in the media that she is going Mao's way. She is reviving many of Mao's dictums. And she, she actually has been called uh, Mao 2 zero uh, to some extent. And in China, the criticism of the leadership is totally of a opposite nature. That she is, uh, or the top leadership is going too soft. and. Uh, especially the way some of the concessions have been given to the uh, U.S. Uh, in the context of the trade war. <coughs> now, uh, at the third, uh, last year's third meeting in that chronology was, in October 2018, there was a uh, meeting at a uh, high level where the 2017 Xinjiang Uyghur Autonom Autonomous Region Extremist Law was revised. And Actually, XUAR was declared as if entire region was declared as under surveillance. And some, some media uh, has commented that this total surveillance uh, might be the model which China will emulate in the rest of the country also in the coming days. <coughs> Now this I have already mentioned three significant meetings in February, October and November. And the other kind of internal debates, it's a very strong criticism is coming of the leadership from the so-called the princeling, party princelings, <coughs> in which, just to mention three, these three are uh, considered to be uh, so-called uh, pro-market right-wing uh, powerful factors within the party discourse. 
Tang, Tang Fu Fang is the son of Tang Xiaoping, whom some of us might know was, has been the president of the China uh, physically yeah, association, and he was removed from that uh, on on this date because of it is it makes making a speech which was critical of the some policies of the leadership. Then Hu Da Ping is the son of uh, <coughs> Hu Yaobang. Was also was very critical in one of the speeches he made on 23rd September. Then Liu Yuan is son of Liu Shaqi, uh, who uh, was apparently, as it has been reported, was very unhappy with the uh, speech given by <coughs> Xi Jinping at the 120th anniversary of Liu Shaqi, birth anniversary of Liu Shaqi, where he did he did not or he skirted the entire issue of the the. the <clears throat> differences uh, which had cropped up between Liu Shaoqi and the other leaders, uh, Mao, etc. So he had given his speech separately elsewhere and for that uh, he was uh, removed from his post. Then the major issue within the party is regarding the reforms. GDKF is the Chinese acronym for Kaika Kaiba. And just to save time, I have to go and ask. How to evaluate the reforms? That's, that's one of the issues. How to evaluate the reforms since the 18th Party Congress? And there is now debate on the nature and the space of the reforms since Xi Jinping comes into the picture and prior to that. And then how to evaluate the role of reforms, uh, uh, reforms found, uh, founding fathers or founding figures like Tang Xiaoping. There is a lot of debate now going on. Uh, even Tang Xiaoping is not finding uh, favor in certain quarters on certain issues with the top leadership today. And then how to evaluate or sum up the reform experience both pre-2012 and uh, post-2012. Now some additional challenges in 2018. Now economic slowdown we have already mentioned. Uh, and trade frictions with the U.S. Of course, as was mentioned by Ambassador Kanta also, that it cannot be denied that the second session of the NPC, or in particular the report presented by Li Keqiang, there was, although there was not explicit reference to uh, the U.S. except for one uh, place, the elephant in the room was U.S. throughout the report. It's very, very visible. And then uh, in December last year, three meetings took place. In fact, it was the Central Economic Work Conference, which is a routine, regular, annual exercise which the party does. And uh, the reports say that even this year's uh, government work report, which was presented by Li Kachia, was actually finally approved and finalized at the Central Economic Work Conference held on 20th December. Which is held for two days. And before that, uh, 18 December was the uh, Xi Jinping's speech uh, to mark the 40th anniversary of uh, the reforms, which initially, actually, I was going to talk today about focusing on that more than anything else. But then I thought, then I will widen the uh, context, political context, uh, to discuss the NPC session. And uh, this, uh, Xi Jinping's speech has not been uh, discussed much. Uh, outside China or in the English media. One reason could be because uh, for some strange reasons uh, we, we have the, for example, we have the uh, second session Li Keqiang's government work report available in English. But we still don't have the English version of Xi Jinping's speech marking the 40th anniversary of reforms. Because in some quarters this speech is being compared to in its political significance, it's been compared to the party's 1981 resolution. Uh, uh, and it has summed up uh, the 40 years of reforms in, uh, in, in political terms. And the third meeting was uh, of the Politburo <coughs> on 26 to 28 October. And it Politburo actually gave go-ahead to the work report which was presented by Li Keqiang and prepared by the Central Economic Work Conference on 20th December. So these three meetings were, uh, I think, were very influential and they, in, in effect, uh, decided and approved the political report presented by the 
uh, Prime Minister and it was basically the debate as I mentioned earlier was even the last minute amendments, I mean I, I had a slide earlier which I did not discuss that when the, when the report was sub, uh, read out by Li Keqiang on 5th of March, the length was some 19,000 characters. Now, I mean, many of you might be amused that wh what is this counting the number of characters and this is very important in China. Uh, also, because many people earn their bread and butter on the basis of how many characters they write. Uh, and when, 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 when the report was finally approved on 15th March, it was 20,200 characters. Because, because there were 83 amendments, which, which are not yet discussed much uh, because it's too early, it's not even one month it concluded. So, uh, so the, disc the amendments were also pertaining to the nature of, for example, um, the various uh, uh, funding measures to the provinces by the center, banking loans, bank, uh, ba uh, bank had their own concerns. And there was a joke which I read in one of the newspapers which said that uh, at the time of second session when it was being held, the joke going around was that uh, if, you, if, you, if you owe a bank uh, one million uh, yuan, then you are in trouble. If you owe hundred million, then the bank is in trouble. <laughs> and if you owe hundred billion, then the whole world's economy is in trouble. And uh, so, so th these were the, you know, absolutely uh, meticulously each and every character, word was being discussed by provincial representatives in the smaller group meetings, etc, etc. So, <clears throat> now, these are some of the contradictions which emerge or the source of these contradictions is again <coughs> the, what should be the nature of reforms or what should be the speed of reforms. Uh, as I mentioned, that one is hearing from Xi Jinping supply-side reforms, which, which has not happened so far. So supply-side reforms versus party above market. Repeatedly it has been said, you must have read it in the various uh, reports also, various meetings, that the market will be given uh, freer hand in deciding uh, policies. But then always it is said that, but the party will still be above. All of us know that now in private enterprises also a party unit has been established. Then words versus deeds, same. So when will the substantive reforms measures will be announced? Then the, again the contradiction between rapid growth and expeditious reforms. Both cannot perhaps go simultaneously. Now no enmity with the US. This, this is again a criticism of the present leadership that it was Tang Xiaoping's almost cardinal princi uh, principle or cardinal words uh, that never get involved with U.S. in any adverse situation and that has now been uh, not happening. Now and then because acceleration of reform was always, always seen as the legitimacy for the party and the continuous growth, economic growth was also seen as very crucial for the survival of the leadership. Both these things now are at stake. And this was the highlight of the Xi Jinping's speech on marking the 40th anniversary uh, of the refor reforms, which says, I will not read out the Chinese part for, to, save the, to save time. It says that we shall reform what needs to be reformed and can be reformed. We shall not reform what does not need to be and cannot be reformed. And this was by one political commentator in Beijing he commented on this particular aspect of the report and he said this is this tent amounts to premature declaration of reform, reform obituary. Now of course uh, what, what one can <coughs> go on with some other aspects of the government work report which was presented by uh, Li Keqiang. Uh, <coughs> Politburo meeting also, I mean what was other than discussing this final report which would be presented at the NPC second session, the Politburo which met on 26, 27th and 28th December, the Politburo members vowed 
they would take the lead in studying and implementing the Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. And I, I don't need to read it, but basically what I am saying is that since the 2017 Party Congress, more and more we see that how the loyalty, the declaration of loyalty and the allegiance and the full faith in the core leadership of Xi Jinping is being repeatedly being emphasized in every major party forum uh, uh, non-stop. Non so what does, what does this indicate? This indicates that there is something very, very intense and serious in terms of inner party debates going on about the uh, future of the reforms, etc. Some of the comments from Beijing based uh, academic or commentators, very legal and legitimate. There is nothing anti party, anti state activities there in Nazim. One is Lu Xiang, CAS expert, and he said that the Politburo meeting warned the party cadres to gear up for the bigger issues than trade war with the US next year. This, was, this statement came in December 2018, so next year means this year. And then Chang Li Fan, another independent political commentator, who said that the Politburo emphasis on Xi Jinping thought and on Xi Jinping leadership is indication she is under mounting political pressure from within. Now, in concluding, now following the 20th anniversary of the reform, China's entry into WTO <coughs> helped economic lift off of China, and at that time, Jiang Zemin had delivered the 20th anniversary speech. Similarly, in 2008, world economic crisis, China overcame it and successfully managed to take its economy to a new level and Ho Jintao had delivered the 30th anniversary speech. So if current trade war with US is to be seen as a crisis, will CPC led by Xi Jinping be any better than his two predecessors? Thank you, Haman, for that you know, fascinating uh, analysis of the uh, nuances of Nika Chang's government work report and also bringing out uh, its context and backdrop. <coughs> now, we'll have the two discussions. Now we'll start with uh, Professor Monty. He'll make he'll offer his comments and then I'll come. I think uh, we have heard very important presentations already and uh, I don't want to make yet another full presentation. I think the, uh, the three formulations from the three uh, experts uh, need to be uh, understood fully, uh, starting from um, in the reverse order from Hamad, uh, that uh, there has been failure in deepening of reforms, uh, and uh, that has uh, been the subject of one of intense debates. Uh, now, the um, if I, and he referred to the two uh, earlier celebrations also, uh, if I uh, uh, put it differently, I think at every moment there has been a debate on reforms. Uh, none of these uh, uh, leaders even while they were in full command, uh, never did they have uh, such a smooth sailing as to not have a debate. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, had with Chan Yun friendly debates, but uh, then there was this conclusion that he lost the southern tour, intensifying the privatization and so on. Uh, in the Hu Jintao case, Jiang Zemin uh, pushed, he, he decided, even when Tang was alive, he decided to push the Tang line uh, uninterrupted. But when Hu Jintao took over, there was this debate, and there were serious problems already visible uh, in, the, in, in society, inequality, environmental problems, regional disparity, social discontent, and so on. Uh, and therefore, you saw the shift to scientific uh, meaning, balance, coordinated development. And Xi Jinping is continuing that with even more 
serious problems. I mean, a larger economy with more serious problems. Uh, therefore, um, uh, I would not expect any smooth or fast or clear so-called deepening uh, somehow uh, of the reforms. Uh, the, the point that uh, Anand made that the, uh, on paper it might look good, uh, all these welfare uh, measures, but how they are implemented is a question. I would go a step further. I think even on paper these policies are not foolproof. If you look at uh, health, education, uh, elderly care, uh, particularly distress migration, rural crisis, uh, there is no uh, fundamental breakthrough in the overall, uh, overall perspective. Uh, for example, the, um, uh, you know, there is a very interesting uh, uh, statement in the Chang report. Uh, the uh, registered urban population is a little over 60%, a uh, little less than 61 around 61. And urban residents constitute 44%. Uh, look at the hukou, those who have the hukou and those who don't have hukou. And this has been, and, and this is an understatement. And this comes to about 250 million or so, but uh, the number is far more than that. Uh, similarly, on, uh, it's good to see that uh, worker sites are definitely in the uh, investment law, but uh, in reality, uh, worker slides still do not uh, have a political significance. It is workers' welfare program, so you got workers' political rights in, uh, in enterprises. Uh, uh, and therefore, the social welfare program, and true, in fact, I would uh, highlight a little more uh, that he has done the three critical battles that they have talked about. And the whole of China, uh, I wish the foreign press also took note of this, uh, whole of China uh, in every level is talking about three critical battles. Uh, managing financial risks, uh, achieving the poverty eradication goals by 2020, and having very strict implementation of the environmental anti-pollution measures. Uh, and uh, uh, that is monitoring mechanisms, reporting points in terms of dates and uh, places and so on, on all three. On, on poverty, since in India we are now discussing poverty uh, as and uh, quite a lot, very interesting. Um, it is, uh, you know, they have identified, as Anand pointed out, uh, three uh, regions and three prefectures, mainly minority uh, inhabited areas, but some others also. But, uh, so it is region focused, number one. Number two, it is, uh, even though 5000 yuan is the official line as of 2016, it hasn't been changed. But the, uh, the approach is not just income. It is food, clothing, housing, education, health care. But with focus on providing employment to all who can be employed. And last year, the Chang report says they provided over 3 million jobs to the uh, poor. Uh, and they lifted 13.61 uh, uh, million last year. This year, they have a target of 10 million. And next year, another 10, 11 million would be left, uh, would be lifted. Therefore, uh, you know, uh, and this is what, uh, this, I mean, I, I'm going to conclude by saying that is all part of the legitimation strategy and the government strategy of the CRG. So we have to understand the features of the legitimation strategy uh, at home and globally and the governance strategy so that uh, dissidents, rebellion, <coughs> actual problems um, from various sectors are managed. So the poverty eradication strategy is part of a major legitimation strategy. But it, uh, Therefore, the employment-focused poverty eradication strategy. Yes, there are grants given, and uh, you know, very interestingly, right from uh, 
the poverty eradication conference that she held uh, last year, uh, and Rika Chang's report and the NDRC report uh, to which uh, uh, Anand referred. Uh, very interesting uh, reference to uh, Xi Jinping demanding, uh, and Rika Chang quote said, uh, precision targets, precision should be, that means particular area, particular group, particular family, whether they have been actually lifted or not. Uh, and uh, cheating has been noted and is punished. That is giving inflated reports about populations and so on. Coming to the Sujit's formulation, I agree, the foreign trade community, investors community has mixed uh, feelings, but that is bound to be. The point is, uh, how does it facilitate, how does it compare with the earlier situation? I think that you would agree that it is a major step forward. Uh, that the, uh, particularly in procedures, uh, the complicated, uh, even though it was much less complicated than the Indian procedures are told by some Indian businessmen who uh, have investment or trade in China. But, uh, uh, compared to that, this simplifies quite a lot uh, and even though it is uh, administrative mechanism as a settlement and not international, they want to maintain international standards within the, within China, they have said. Therefore, uh, it, ha it was bound to be mixed and there will be even more pressure from Trump and you know, the trade representative and so on, that is not enough. <coughs> want to do more. So it's a process. But I want to uh, take another two minutes to talk about uh, 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 the NPC Standing Committee Chairperson's report. Very few people pay any attention to that. And ever since uh, the fourth plenum where uh, the rule of law uh, was focused uh, uh, in 2016, uh, 15, uh, you know, we have been closely looking at the legal system. Now this uh, uh, foreign investment law is one that is a major e-commerce law, uh, very important. Uh, I, I have no time to discuss that, but I think somebody should uh, look at that. Uh, there is a very important law on contracting rural land. And uh, you know, two years ago, they relaxed, uh, in, in fact, in the 19th party conference, on this, they had uh, made some new uh, paperwork <coughs> that uh, without the collective uh, uh, consulting the and getting two thirds people's <coughs> consent in the collective, they cannot transfer business land. Now it is legalized. There is a, and I haven't seen this law myself, therefore all the details I don't know, uh, and several such. Uh, uh, and uh, they revised uh, the company law, the civil aviation law, uh, and so on. But uh, I hope uh, somebody, um, some young people who study politics, uh, would uh, look at the new amended organic law for grassroots rural government and new amended organic law for urban government. So both the organic laws of 98 and 2001 have been amended this time. I haven't had a chance to uh, get access to that. And a new set of very powerful environmental laws have been passed in this Congress. Uh, and uh, because uh, the you know, environmental uh, ecological civilization was one of the five things. But, <coughs> It was never translated into such, and it was only at the realm of policy and administration. Now they want a legal environmental regime. So I hope some environmental uh, observers <coughs> in India will uh, look up to that. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Professor Mante, for those comments. Uh, now, which Professor Alcacharya? Thank you, Chair. Um, so, um, I really have some very, very unstructured kind of um, points that I want to raise here. Um, 
that wasn't too clear as to what exactly the role of the discussing group would be here. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of a cheeky thing. I'm going to uh, discuss Manu's discussing point. <laughs> <laughs> and in the sense that I, I just like to pick up uh, because I uh, also um, agree on the, the essence of the three presentations that he has uh, he has he has extracted. Uh, and, and I'm afraid I have a slight shift in the way uh, I would interpret uh, the, the essence of those three presentations. Um, so, in terms of the first point, which was really when he was talking about uh, Heyman's point that uh, this failure of the deepening of the reforms, uh, which is under intense debate, uh, my sense of the reading of the kind of commentaries and, and uh, whatever uh, debates that take place uh, is that, uh, in fact, it's not so much the deepening of the reforms, really. It's about the fact that these reforms do not seem to be uh, seem to be focused uh, on, uh, on on the kind of transformation that had guided the <coughs> earlier reforms. So, for instance, uh, what I say here is that when Tang Xiaoping starts his reform, the uh, idea was obviously very obviously to become rich. Uh, the fact that we have to achieve a certain material level of development. Um, thereafter, the Questions have been about the imbalances that have been created, or the inequities that have been generated, or the uh, increasing um, uh, increasing um, uh, struggles that are taking place within different groups, uh, which have not equally benefited from the reforms. So the kind of challenges that the reforms are facing, uh, which is what led to the harmonious development concept and so on. Uh, but it seems to me that uh, the fundamental objectives uh, uh, of uh, which Xi Jinping has laid out in terms of uh, completely removing poverty or uh, addressing those people who have not benefited from the earlier reforms uh, or the newer uh, problems uh, do not seem to find a place. So the debate really is about who are these reforms for? And what exactly? Uh, where are where are the what are the goals? And uh, do we still have any element of, of a socialist uh, component in the reforms? Uh, so I think there are far more deeper debates, not just about the imbalances or the need to focus on the environment. So the challenge to Xi Jinping from within is coming not just because uh, he's uh, he's not deepening the reforms enough, but the fact that these are not addressing fundamental concerns uh, and that it is about benefiting only certain sections, uh, the corporate party nexus that is emerging, the kind of uh, new uh, groups uh, that have started to take control of the agenda. So I think the debate is far more, uh, so it's, it's not just, uh, so it's, it's much more complex. Um, about the point that um, uh, that Anand, uh, that uh, Anand was talking about, which is that uh, so seems to be on paper a fair enough, uh, uh, fair slew of reforms in, in in various things, but whether they would be implemented. Um, my concern more is that in all the reforms that Anand was looking at, there is quite a clear uh, movement uh, of uh, of of the the reducing role of the state. The state is gradually moving uh, more and more out, uh, passing its responsibilities to non-state actors, passing its responsibilities to private players. <coughs> of course, they will control the private players also. But the fact is that uh, the, and in fact, this ties up therefore with the kind of argument that Heyman was making, that where is this resistance coming from? Uh, so how exactly is the implementation are going to come about if the state is not going to be the major player and, and how is this uh, who's, the regulation of these new reforms and uh, the extent to which the interests of those who again who are at the margins are going to be taken care of if the state is really not mainly in the picture. Uh, and finally the point about uh, uh, about his uh, assessment or, or his comment on Biswajit's uh, presentation that uh, 
it seems that although the new reforms uh, or uh, have not been welcomed very well, uh, Manu's uh, feeling is that it's a major advance. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. One is, of course, a major advance in its own terms. Uh, but here I will just bring in two other relevant uh, or two other points to contextualize what I feel has been the major focus of the outside world as far as this NPC was concerned, which was about what would be their response uh, in terms, uh, in, 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 in economic uh, uh, terms to the ongoing trade war. I mean, that's clearly, everybody has mentioned that and I agree that <coughs> it's really the Sino-US trade war that is the backdrop. Uh, on which many of these decisions are being judged. Now, two other political, big political debates, uh, which has, uh, so I, I, I looked at a lot of the writing from Western uh, commentators uh, to this, uh, not so much on what the Chinese, uh, exactly the policies were, which were very well outlined. And so there are two sets of issues. The two questions that come, one is this, trade war, how is it going to end, what is it all about? Uh, is it only about, is it only a trade war or is there a larger question? Uh, is it a new cold war? Is this really going to be the battle uh, which will decide the, who, who comes out uh, supreme? So this is, this, is, this is the, and the second question of course is that is this the end of the liberal order that are the Chinese now gradually positioning themselves <coughs> to transform uh, the current global financial uh, economic architecture. I, this has been going on for quite some time and in fact it has paralleled the debate uh, or the, the way in which the trade war has also been uh, planning out. And in that context I'd like to mention that certainly the United States has expressed complete disappointment. Most commentators in the, in the US have, have expressed their disappointment at, the, uh, at these uh, the new concessions that the Chinese seem to be, have given. Uh, one major um, problem that they have raised is that, uh, uh, I mean, this is not new, that this, these debates, uh, these reforms were on the anvil since 2015. Uh, but, uh, as Mr. Jeet also pointed out and Hemant also, that uh, they were pushed through with great hurry on this, uh, in this NPC. And uh, so the main contention from the, most of the American commentators and, and some Europeans as well, was that there was not sufficient debate with the stakeholders on the American side or the European side about these, uh, these reforms. That uh, many of those reforms were not taking on board the concerns that have been raised by the American side in this uh, discussion. So, so that was number one, that they did not really answer or meet the concerns with which uh, the discussions are ongoing. Uh, and the second was that it still leaves uh, them at the mercy of the state, Chinese state. That it's not as if the private uh, sphere is going to be enlarged in any significant way. Now, if we take these two arguments and try and sort of address the larger question, is that is this really uh, the thing about the US and the, the Chinese uh, contention and collusion, uh, not collusion, contention over uh, over, over uh, powerful status and, and, and emerging as, as number one or whatever. Um, I'd like to just bring two aspects that if these are these are also uh, issues which uh, have been affecting a lot of Chinese intellectuals and academics uh, that this is not a, this is this is not a fight that they they want that is to say, China-US confrontation. Uh, they are not ready for it. They are not prepared for it. Uh, they believe that uh, they, they have a long way to go and uh, therefore this is not about supremacy at all. It's about the US trying to show the Chinese over their proper place, uh, which is that there is a considerable gap between the Chinese and some scholars have pointed out that the differential between the US and the Chinese uh, is roughly the same as that which existed between China, uh, between Japan and the US in the interwar years, which means that there's a considerable gap. So they say that there is a fair amount of distance that we have to go. Uh, and therefore, we resent this, this, literally this imposition 
of us trying to unseat the Americans from their uh, and therefore the the nature of this trade war has to be also uh, understood in that context. Uh, the second thing is about how the uh, the second objection and that I think that's where uh, Xi Jinping's own position uh, is uh, is uh, uh, is being affected. Uh, one is of course this how he is dealing with this challenge from the United States. And number two, how is he pushing his agenda of the BRI? And this is this, his signature campaign. And uh, it's also part of the solution that he sees to the domestic issues in China. There are a lot of domestic problems are going to be sorted out if the Belt and Road goes up to be. Uh, and therefore, he, the, 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 the problem with the pressure that the US is now uh, bringing on him uh, is uh, is something that the domestic audience is also looking at. Like how does he uh, how does he deal with this test of standing up to the Americans economically and politically? And uh, therefore, the question is that: Are we seeing a new Cold War where the United States is ranging the European powers on one side and bringing the pressure to bear on the Chinese? I think. What he has skillfully demonstrated to the domestic audience and to people at home is that they are fairly capable of dealing with this pressure uh, in ways in which they uh, in, in, in ways in which they are not directly confronting the U.S. but indirectly managing to achieve their goals. Uh, and one uh, recent, in fact, side by side with the NPC was this whole European issue where it was. But it, was, it appeared as if the Europeans were also getting um, aligned with the United States in putting pressure on the Chinese uh, to, uh, to uh, whether, whether it was on the question of Huawei or it was on the question of um, um, the, the Belt and Road and so on. Uh, but I think what Xi Jinping has managed to convey through his European tour is that he is perfectly capable of ensuring that there is no united front against China and that the Chinese uh, have the beer with her uh, and the means to play upon the problems that the Europeans are facing themselves economically and politically and that they, uh, they, 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 they will be able to uh, deal with, with this. Uh, so this is adding to his stature at home. Uh, it's also uh, uh, contributing to the significance of the BRI uh, and the fact that the BRI is <coughs> likely to uh, bring significant benefits to China. So I think these are some of the issues that get mixed up in many of the domestic challenges, uh, particularly when we are looking at how China is positioned against the dominant challenges from without. I think I'll just stop there before it gets more confused. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks, Anka, for making those points for it all, discussing the discussants remarks and then bringing in more points. Uh, now the floor is open for, for comments and questions. Uh, we have only limited time, maybe about 20 25 minutes. Keep your comments and questions as concise as possible, please. And if you want to know, identify yourself, that would be nice. Wow. Shri Prakash from the Academy of International Studies. It seems to me that you know, one goes by previous reports of the National People's Congress, there used to be much more about the, I use the term, third world or developing countries. In terms of uh, the worldview that was being articulated, and especially now that globalization has, sorry, has been accepted as the central um, perspective of the Chinese Communist Party. Surely it cannot be anybody's case that globalization only means China dealing with US or Europe. Uh, after all, uh, since the days of Mao, uh, and so on. I mean, China has in particular given attention to its policies towards the developing countries. And I don't know whether it is the reading of the NPC report here or it is actually the report itself. 
it seems to suggest that this aspect of um, China's thinking on foreign policy, security, economic assistance is uh, not at all included in, uh, in other elections. Uh, what we'll do, we'll uh, combine you know, three, four questions or comments and then request uh, panelists to respond. So we'll come in next. Yeah, Manoj. Thanks, uh, Manoj Joshi from the Observer Research Foundation. Uh, I think I agree with uh, Vishwajit when he says that you know this foreign investment law, uh, as of now, uh, doesn't really mean too much. Uh, I don't think the Americans certainly are going to bite, especially when you have that that last point on the dispute resolution mechanism, which, which I think would obviously be a deal breaker in this. And that's why you see the United States itself uh, has also been pushing. Uh, you know, the whole issue of a settlement. Because the complaint of most of the, the um, uh, foreign companies who go to uh, China is the opaqueness of the system. And the fact that, you know, all said and done, when the CPC runs the, the show, meaning they run the judicial system, they run the administrative system, and uh, so there's very little recourse uh, for anyone for anything. But I, I wanted to reply to just a technical uh, thing, which I'm not particularly um, uh, familiar with, and Vishwari probably has uh, some idea. Uh, I saw recently, you know, that one of the sectors which uh, the China, uh, right at the outset, being in 2017, if I recollect, the, one of the first things that uh, the Chinese had announced was that they were going to reform their financial sector, that they were going to open up their financial sector. This was the first thing that they put up to the uh, United States that look, we're going to open this up and. And uh, uh, just recently, I saw that uh, the Chinese have listed some uh, 400 or so domestic bonds in the uh, Bloomberg Barclays Global uh, Aggregate Index, uh, which means it goes global, meaning they, those bonds are now will be open to uh, foreign financing. And there are there are people who say that they could get as much as or 150 billion dollars a year um, uh, through this process, which would help them to improve their. Uh, you know the current account um, uh, uh, situation, which has now been uh, has been uh, you know getting worse. Uh, so, can you comment something on the uh, moves that are being made on this financial sector, and whether they are really related to all this, or they are separate? Um, uh, you know, sort of. A, uh, yeah, Gopal and former secretary in the government. Um, the twenty two. Just come on. I'm, I'm loud enough. Okay. The 20, the they will not be able to get picture no, no, no. of that. So the recording 20, it actually. So. Okay, the, the 2025 uh, uh, outlook which they want to do the reforms and then what they want to become made in, make in China or whatever they are trying to do. Now they are silent now. now. Being silent, is there any strategy you think they have to take it forward because without that they won't be in a position to uh, catch up with the rest on the technological advancement. Maybe I have something. I do, yeah, just a sec. Sorry about this. <coughs> uh, my question is for Professor Dhan. Thank you for a very detailed overview of the foreign investment law. Uh, I wanted to know, according to you, what implication does the foreign investment law have for China's domestic tech ambitions? Because on the one hand, it seems like there is an inclination or, or one avenue to technological absorption from foreign sources has been walled off. And on the other hand, it seems like there's this positive list whereby funding can be funneled into certain high-tech sectors. So where do you think China lands at the end of this? In the interim, it will be its tech ambitions, and why? Thanks. Yeah, uh, yeah let me try and, uh, you know, answer uh, Manoj's uh, question and you know for uh, uh, for some years I think you know the, uh, we have been seeing that China has been slowly opening up to the international uh, you know uh, financial markets so you know with you know it started a, um, almost a decade back after the global financial crisis you know all these dim sum bonds and you know sort of also uh, you know, they actually are on the high road to internationalize the UN. They did uh, succeed to an extent, getting UN um, 
uh, recognizes the you know basket of plants in the uh, the LTRs, and uh, so uh, I think that ambition is there, you know, and uh, and uh, but the problem is that uh, what do, what what do they do with the shadow banking system, and and we just don't know, and uh, and of course the you know all these official uh, pronouncements you never never going to hear anything about the shadow banking system. So the financial system is not going to be opened up all at once because there are significant weaknesses out there, and and the, and the government is is really going to prop up the financial system. Although you know when you look at uh, uh, some of the sectors in the positive list that I mentioned, and I uh, you know you do find some uh, indications that the financial sector, you know, they are inviting foreign capital also in the financial sector, some areas of the financial sector, but. But doing very specific functions, huh? so I think uh, this is uh, this is this is going to be an ongoing process, and there is uh, no doubts about it. Um, uh, Mr. Gopalan's uh, point about uh, the silence on the ma on making change, I think it is strategic. Uh, they don't want to make a song and dance about it because I think you know they have been attacked uh, viciously by the Americans. But at the same time, um, again looking at uh, I mentioned in my presentation that looking at the way they have designed their foreign investment policy and and the way they are targeting foreign investors you know they are actually sort of channelizing foreign investors in those sectors uh, where china is now finding its uh, you know i won't use a competitive advantage but you know the relative strengths and and these are these are all high tech areas you know and china is, is still trying to leverage uh, relatively you know uh, uh, the, the low wage as, as compared to the West, and and really trying to uh, move up that, that path. So I think uh, one is not going to hear make in China um, uh, for strategic reasons, but uh, China is really going to consolidate the way it is uh, doing it at this point. And I was quite amazed when I looked at the entire list, and uh, you know it is quite amazing. I think we need to uh, study that even more. And even for our own, uh, you know, so Paul, our policymakers need to look at that policy, this, uh, this policy, very carefully, because you you can't have a, a, a carte blanche for uh, you know inviting foreign investors and doing. Foreign investors need to do a particular job, and they and this is what the Chinese are doing. On the on Chinese uh, tech ambitions again, you know, it's sort of uh, almost a similar uh, uh, response about uh, yeah, you know, it was it is. This this law, I'm, I'm sure, is only going to reinforce that, and uh, and quite clearly, you know, if you look at, you know, why why if you also have to understand why the Americans are so anxious about uh, intellectual property and us, uh, and stuff like that. Yeah, you know, uh, if you look at uh, just one indicator, which is uh, looking the, the the number of patents which are taken in different countries. Today, uh, the Chinese of patent office is not not just the largest patent office. The total applications received by this office is more than double that of China in, in the United States. And again, if you look at uh, the China, you know, United States balance of uh, you know their uh, external sector balance, there there are two sectors in which the Americans have a have a positive balance. One is agriculture. And the second is intellectual property. You know, the intellectual uh, property payments they, they, they receive is, is larger than the receipts are larger than the payments. And they're extremely worried that if the Chinese keep expanding this their horizon and they start uh, you know accumulating so, so much of intellectual property, so much of patents, uh, you know, the, the Americans will be left in the lurch. Uh, and I don't think the Americans have any uh, strategy. Uh, to really stop the Chinese in the tracks, and again, as I said, that this foreign investment policy, and importantly, you know, the 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 American company, the foreign companies are not complaining. This is what we all have been discussing: that the foreign companies are not discussing on this issue of intellectual property theft that Americans are saying. The American the American companies have not pushed their gun, the governments to go to the WTO or any other forum and start a dispute or anything or anything like that. So I think we need to also to understand what's going on within within China. So how have the Chinese, uh, the, the the government, ha how have they been able to s silence the you know the co companies who, according to the Americans, are being exploited in China? So I think there are lots of issues that we need to uh, understand. We just got, can't go by the Western press and the way they are projecting this issue. Things are much more nuanced. Thanks. Can I add a few shifts? Uh, the 
uh, on this absence of reference to 2025, uh, I agree with Mr. Jain, uh, clearly strategic because Trump actually cited that yeah. in his uh, many comments. There is a whole section in Li Keqiang's report on new growth drivers and it is technology and innovation driven. And uh, this year, 2.2% of the GDP is on R&D. And you know, innovation is the key throughout the report and in China today. Uh, I'm Yishi from Jawaharlal University. Uh, I would like to throw one question to all, whoever panelists wants to answer. In the sense that a lot of discussion now in terms of deglobalization. It's no longer globalization is not only prote uh, protested or criticized by the leftists but also the rightists and uh, now the governments uh, uh, responding to this rightist criticism in form of the U.S. government or uh, British is there. So what according to you is Chinese uh, scholars as well as governments uh, view about this protectionism or the deglobalization, the discussion that is going on in the academic circles? Um, I'm Veda, I'm a researcher at ICS. I have a question for Professor Hema Tatlaka. Sir, you mentioned that uh, hundreds of people or thousands of people were involved in drafting the report. I'd also read that they sent out online surveys to over 300,000 online Chinese um, web users in China to gauge their feedback. So I think my question is, who is the primary audience according to you for this report and for the speech? Like, also crudely putting it, do you think the Chinese people care as much as we clearly do? <laughs> Any questions on this side? This microphone. Yeah, my question is to uh, Doctor Doctor Lakai. The first, the uh, I have to sir. <laughs> yeah, I have one. This uh, like I totally agree with that. The thing which you know talk that the party always the government always put at China. Chinese Chinese system is better than the outside, you know, uh, like they always, you know, condemn or whatever, criticize that the U.S. the West is doing this thing wrong, even only good thing is in China. And the case of Sinwa Lianpo, so every, you know, evening uh, it, it has been broadcasted, you know, so it's there. But uh, the second, uh, uh, this is the one which I agree. And the second one uh, which I see that, you know, uh, you said that, uh, that crackdown on, on Thaizadan, that princely. But here also I see that there is elevation of Cochin Thao's son to a party, uh, to a provincial party general secretary. You know. So how do you think? Is it like some faction, like uh, youth league faction is going up or coming up and uh, of this kind? Is your thumb? Any other questions? Or you know, any investment protection, uh, you know, agreement or uh, law, one critical aspect is dispute settlement mechanism. What kind of recourse you know, for investors have when, when they are different in the state and with another, you know, commercial entity. Now, dispute settlement mechanism which has been uh, spelled out in uh, foreign investment law uh, adopted on 15th March, uh, how does it compare with uh, the dispute settlement mechanism reflected in updated bilateral investor protection and, you know, agreement that we are projecting. You know, the earlier agreement we had to jettison, one major reason was that, uh, as you mentioned, uh, uh, we were running into serious problem. We lost uh, some of several uh, arbitration cases on that. How does it compare to that? Our own dispute settlement framework and what Chinese have now reflected in the uh, foreign investment law. Okay, thank you for a couple of questions. Uh, let, let me begin with uh, the question of uh, 10,000 people I mentioned about. Uh, in fact, I quickly in passing also mentioned that who were these people? It's not that it was circulated at random among general public in society or something. Basically, it's a government and party structure at all levels where the drafts were circulated and uh, party carders, officials, government carders, officials at various levels 
were involved in the drafting of the report, including various representatives from industry, banking sector, etc., etc. And I mean, it's a whole exercise which starts months in advance and it's circulated at various levels and then it comes back with uh, suggestions to you know, change something or add something or incorporate something and then again it goes back, etc. So that is the exercise I was referring to. It's not something which is prepared by some speechwriter or some uh, experts, you know, just few days in advance of the event to take place or something. What I meant was this, that it's a long exercise and which involves, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, people representing all kinds of interests, both uh, economic and political and social, etc. So that was the idea. But officially, there were full team of uh, economic experts. According to the reports, the, at various levels, the economic experts who were part, uh, who took part in the drafting of the report, is somewhere around three to four thousand. So that was what I was referring to. And um, about the factionalism, etc. I mean, uh, this this is as some uh, Professor Monti had also mentioned that at every crucial juncture, I mean, there has been very intense debate. Uh, if you go back to even since the party was founded in 1921, etc. So various uh, factions. Uh, various uh, uh, ideological positions, various uh, interests, etc. Even uh, the princelings is not a homogeneous, uniform uh, group within the party. You know, they also come and represent certain particular, specific interest. Because uh, I don't know how many of uh, you are aware or us are aware that m most large uh, uh, state-owned enterprises in China, or public sector enterprises in China, are uh, basically uh, run by these princes. So at a given point of time, a particular policy, if it comes into uh, question or contradiction with certain other interests, then maybe that particular uh, group of interests gets affected. That's how the factionalism also gets, you know, uh, into action. So. Uh, <clears throat> that is the this thing and about glo globalization or deglobalization I, I don't know my take is that when Chinese leaders go outside they talk about globalization but when they speak inside they talk about protection so, uh, uh, you know, the Chinese uh, uh, have uh, reduced the reference to foreign policy and global uh, strategies uh, in uh, political reports as well as world reports. And uh, that is one. Uh, <coughs> second is that uh, uh, I think they are no longer interested in uh, democratizing the global order or democratizing the global political order. There is a reference uh, only to uh, promote governance reforms in the world economy. That's all. Otherwise, the new, new international economic and political and economic order, that kind of democratization is no longer on the Chinese agenda. Therefore, uh, in fact, from uh, Davos onwards, Xi Jinping's speech in Davos onwards uh, last uh, two years ago, uh, it's very clear that they are the defenders of present type of economic global existence. They want to defend that. Uh, initial point, then we'll come to just, just to add to what just now Professor Monty said, and also in my reply to your question on this, I mean, in my understanding, what I have understood on the basis of the Chinese debates, the Chinese uh, economic growth's main purpose unlike what the media is uh, giving the impressions to us about whether geopolitically China's uh, you know, dominance or hegemony, etc., etc. In my understanding, for the Chinese, the main purpose for economic uh, strength or strong economic growth basically is for their social stability inside. 
not to make their voices heard outside. <coughs> that, that, that is what that their economic strength, their economic growth, the whole focus on economic growth is towards uh, social stability at home, not so much as to let make their voices to be heard in forums outside. Um, uh, Brother Ambassador Kanta's uh, question, I think what we what we did was uh, you know, the the bare minimum. Uh, to um, give that impression that we, uh, 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 we, we we want to come out of that problem that uh, these investment laws are uh, because there are certain issues that we pointed out that uh, for instance you know um, Indian government has um, taken some measures in the, uh, the our, our intellectual property law for instance patent law for instance where, where to uh, counter you know high prices of drugs uh, we, we we, we provide these compulsory licenses and all that. So uh, you know, so the, so many of us pointed out that you know these issues could actually be a big problem if suppose tomorrow you give a compulsory license and and uh, the foreign investor takes you to the cleaners. So what we have done is that we have uh, a firewall only a few areas in our uh, dispute settlement. Uh, mechanism, the investor stage is chosen a mechanism to exclude some of these areas. Essentially it remains the same um, and of course uh, the, um, the only thing that we have added additionally and we, 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 we could have avoided adding was that the first uh, point of uh, contact uh, for the foreign investor would be a, a domestic court and then, then they go to arbitration. In fact all the investors first go to the domestic court and then they get frustrated with the proceedings here and then go to international arbitration. So there is nothing in our law today that can stop foreign investor taking a government to international arbitration. But the, the Chinese have not gone that way at all and that's that's one of the things I'm sure we are going to hear more about this. And um, uh, so um, and many other aspects of it. The one, once the negative list comes out then there will be I think more uh, issues that, that we need to discuss. One other, you know, finally I would also like to mention, you know, I, since I was only asked to school speak on the foreign investment law, I, I focused on this. But uh, like uh, Professor Monty mentioned about um, the other parts of the economic reform that they are uh, uh, carrying out, including the e-commerce uh, legislation. I think we need to understand, we need to, uh, have, we need to have a discussion on this. And particularly in light of what um, uh, Hemant mentioned that, you know, they are, uh, the Chinese are clearly going in for globalization, you know, in the international sphere. And this is Xi Jinping's uh, own slogan, you know, going, going uh, uh, global. And uh, there are many such initiatives and we need to discuss this. And, and, and part of the thing that we are seeing uh, uh, that they are focusing on the domestic uh, economy, it's also part of the rebalancing that is, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, they have to undertake because uh, they clearly know now that the international economy is not going to give them that much of leverage you know, which, which, which they had in the past few decades. So uh, the, they, they are actually investing in the domestic economy because that is going to be something that is going to be the growth driver in the future. Awesome. Any, any other comments from the speakers or from the discussions? Uh, a small question, if it is allowed. Okay, please, please, go ahead. I'm sorry, uh, this is to Professor Hemant, actually. I just wanted to say, you were talking about Mao 2.0 during your presentation. Now, Mao had ideologues to guard his policy decisions, like Kang Sheng, Chen Boda, etc. Now, how do you see Xi Jinping being masked? Who are his ideologues who are actually giving that sort of a cover? And then second, on your reply, you said, Prince Ling faction is not a homogeneous faction. So do you see how is Bozilai going to be treated now, since he was part of this faction? Now, do you think his resurrection or something under Xi Jinping? <laughs> well, these are all speculations and uh, I will then reply also in spe speculatively. <laughs> About Mao 2.0, uh, as I mentioned during my presentation also, that everybody knows 